Welcome to another podcast from School of Surgery, where today we're going to be talking about clinical academic careers. My name is Keaton Jones. I'm an academic clinical fellow in general surgery in the Health Education Thames Valley Deanery in the United Kingdom. I'm here with Dr. Denise Best, who's the Academic Clinical Careers Manager at the Oxford University Clinical Academic Graduate School, which was brought about in 2009 to promote clinical academic careers. To give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about today, we'll talk about the background of integrated academic clinical training in the UK, talk about career pathway for clinical academic training, the Academic Foundation Programme, the Academic Clinical Fellowship Programme, Academic Clinical Lectureship Programme, beyond the lectureship program, negatives of a clinical academic career, positives of a clinical academic career, and finally, a little bit about surgical academic careers. So first of all, thank you for, thank you for your time today. The first question is, when did formal integrated academic training programs come into existence, and what is the overview of the NIHR integrated program? Integrated academic training programs started between 2006 and 2007, with the first few posts which we'll describe in a minute. The, one of the reasons for them coming about was that up until that point, the route into clinical academic training and into a clinical academic career was a bit haphazard. People would do a bit of research here, a bit of clinical work there. There was a lot of movement. There was no actual real career pathway as such and I guess that people found it quite difficult to navigate. This resulted in a bit of a crisis of the numbers of clinical academics and uh, concern about who was going to be teaching continuing years of medical school. So these posts were established to create a clearer pathway to clinical academic careers which combined both research and clinical work. Okay, and so fresh out of medical school, uh, one of the first first posts that we'll encounter is a foundation programme, which currently is two years in the UK, and I have here to something called an academic foundation post. Would you be able to tell me a little bit more about these positions? Academic foundation posts are available in foundation schools around the UK, and there's lots of information on the UK foundation programme website about where these are and how they're distributed. Basically, in the two years of the foundation program, in each year, there's generally some protected time for research if you're in an academic foundation program post. This varies between foundation schools. Sometimes it's a day a week as day release to do your research. Sometimes it's a day a week in the first year and then a four month block in the second year. The research components of the post are usually under the oversight of the uh, attached university and there is usually an academic supervisor or academic research supervisor who supervises the foundation doctor in their research. There is obviously a connection between the research supervisor and the foundation program and it forms part of the annual review of competence progression to um, for academic trainees to see what they've been doing in their time. Although Typically, it's just to establish that they've been doing something productive rather than used as a way that they might not reach their clinical competencies each year. Um, there's also access to some of the taught programmes available in universities and academic trainees after the foundation programme can then go on and apply for the next academic training post, which we'll talk about in a minute. Okay, so if uh, I wanted to apply for an academic foundation programme in the UK, how would I go about that? There's a national application process, which is an online process run by the UK Foundation Programme Organisation, so UKFPO. Through that, there's the opportunity to apply for two centres for academic foundation posts, and then the various centres look at the applications and decide who they're going to shortlist and do a local interview to that centre. Uh, that way, most of the, the academic foundation places around the country can be filled. 
Okay. And the natural progression after the foundation program uh, in an integrated academic pathway would be an academic clinical fellowship or ACF. Could you tell us a little bit about those positions? Sure. The ACF program is starts at the specialty training level in the sense that some posts are at core training, but they will have run through after core training into a higher specialty. So we regard them as specialty training posts, even though they might be appointed at core training level. And these posts can be appointed at any, any point between ST1 and ST3. This is determined by the host deanery and the university who oversee these posts. So nationally in the UK, there'll be lots of different posts in different specialties at different levels. These are all summarised on the NIHR Trainee Coordinating Centre website. Um, and so at one glance, you can see nationally where the posts are and what level they are. The posts involve are for three years. That's three years as part of a full training programme at a consultant level. And during those three years, 25% of that time is protected for research. So about nine months out of the three years is protected for research. And that's distributed in different ways. Again, sometimes that can be day release, sometimes block release, and sometimes it can be a combination of both over the three years. The idea is that that time is distributed in a way that's beneficial for whatever research project uh, the ACF decides that they want to do. And for some sorts of projects, block release is better, and some sorts of projects, day release is better. The ACF has an honorary relationship with their university, so they're substantively NHS employees with an honorary university post. And they have an academic supervisor, a research supervisor within the university, and have access to the programmes that the university runs for its students as well, for its graduate students generally, as well as a, a research training programme that's set up by the university specifically for ACFs. This is a requirement of the NIHR for all universities to provide a research training programme for ACFs. So I know for an, as an example, I'm an ACF here in Oxford and uh, we have the opportunity to participate in the postgraduate diploma in uh, research, research methods or, or health research. And I know plenty of my colleagues across the country and other ACF programmes have access to similar higher degree programmes which can go on um, and you can complete a master's degree, which is very useful during that interim period between foundation programme and potentially a higher degree. And so my final question in terms of ACF posts is what is the desirable outcome uh, once you've completed the uh, period of an academic clinical fellowship? For most ACFs, the desirable outcome is to put together a research proposal during their research time so that they can apply for funding to do a PhD. Some ACFs will come in with a PhD, relatively few of them, and they'll spend their time actually uh, trying to get some more publications so that they can apply for further funding after their ACF. What happens if an ACF is not successful in attracting external funding is that they return to their clinical training program full time. And during that period, many of them then reapply for funding. Typically, it can take one or two applications to get funding. And usually most of them who want to are then able to do a PhD. That involves taking time out of the training programme, so stepping out of the training programme for a number of years, three, possibly four years, but that's the maximum that's available, uh, to do their PhD before they then go back into their guaranteed place in the training programme and have the opportunity to then apply for further academic posts after they've got their clinical competencies re-established. Okay, and uh, the application process for an academic clinical fellowship is different to that of an AFP. Could you uh, tell us what it's about? So there are a variety of ways to apply for an ACF, depending on where the ACF is based in the country. The majority of deaneries now have got an online process that is available 
for all applicants. And so it, all of the posts will be advertised through something at the moment that's called Oriel. All of this information will be on the deanery websites as to how to apply for these posts. And the online application is done. Again, it's followed up with a local interview, so local shortlisting and interview. And just recently, there's been a slight change to what then happens. After that point, if the applicant does not already have a training number, whether it be a core training number or a national training number for higher specialty recruitment, they then also have to go to national selection for the specialty or for the appropriate level, core training for example, and be benchmarked against the rest of the applicants to ensure that they're clinically competent to be able to take the post up. So usually the ACF offers are made in late January, early February, and now they're conditional on actually being deemed clinically appointable at national selection, which takes place, I guess, any time up until probably May of the year before the August, September, when the post is taken up. I think it's important to mention that uh, the number of people who will uh, be unsuccessful in their clinically appointable interview later on is going to be very low. Um, but it's an important point to mention as it's a significant change which has only happened very recently. Um, so moving on the natural progression from an ACF this time towards a clinical lectureship. Um, uh, guessing especially junior trainees aren't too sure what these are. So could you tell us a little bit about these positions? Clinical lectureships are available from ST3 onwards and they're for anyone or for doctors and surgeons who have already got a doctorate. For an NIHR funded post, it's important to note that the thesis has to be submitted at the time of application and everything has to be completed before the post can be taken up. There are other posts available at clinical lecture, lecturer level and these are usually funded by universities themselves and the rules around those posts are perhaps slightly more relaxed than the NIHR rules. I would guess there are fewer of those across the country. I don't know how many there are nationally. For example, NIHR fund 100 clinical lectureships across specialties across the UK every year. The aim of the clinical lectureship post to then go on potentially to CCT level. The posts are four years as opposed to the three years of the ACF posts and there are 50-50 clinical research time split. After that hopefully there will be further applications for the likes of an intermediate fellowship, potentially a clinician scientist fellowship. If that's the route that the clinical lecturer things that they'd want to take. The idea for most specialties is that they are able to reach CCT during this period, but in some specialties where training is much longer than four years if you start at ST3, sometimes you don't quite make it to, to CCT. Usually departments will, will find a way to continue that funding to allow the 50-50 split. Um, it's not always guaranteed, but generally, especially in surgical disciplines, locally, that's the case. So in terms of uh, the academic clinical lectureship post, uh, again, it differs from the ACF post. How do we apply to one of these positions? Well, they are really quite different in the sense that they are organised by universities. So each university will advertise their post, usually on their own website, often advertise it in the BMJ and also on a jobs website called jobs.ac.uk. So there isn't a kind of centralised place where all of these posts are advertised, although they can be seen on the NIHR website as to what specialties are available each year. The interesting thing is that up until, this, up until the clinical lectureship point, 
academic trainees are in fact NHS employees with honorary university status, but this flips as a clinical lecturer. They become university employees with honorary NHS status. This doesn't really have much effect on the day-to-day -day, uh, training part of the post at all. Okay, and I think um, so far we've talked a lot about uh, the integrated training pathway, which, as we mentioned, has only been in existence over the last decade or so. And it's important to mention that to pursue a clinical academic career, certainly within the UK, it is not a prerequisite to be part of one of these programmes, whether that be from the beginning at foundation programme level right up to a clinician scientist. Certainly there are people who choose to enter an academic career later on. And actually in terms of numbers, the clinical integrated programmes probably do not take up the uh, majority of clinical academics. And so if you are deciding to pursue an academic career later on, uh, the presence of this kind of inter integrated programme should not be a deterrent, and I'm sure you, you'd agree in that in that respect. Absolutely. Um, so now I'm going to sit in the hot seat, and you can fire away any questions you like. We uh, may have some written down, which I've pre-prepared. I guess you've had the experience now of being part way through your academic clinical career. What do you see as the negatives? to what you've experienced and also what you hear from your senior academic clinical colleagues? So I think the the first one to uh, get out of the way, which is probably the one which is brought up most, is the delicate balance between maintaining a successful clinical career alongside a successful academic career. And the, the, the main thing I'm going to say straight off the, the bat is that there isn't a magic answer so that you can get a perfect 50-50 balance. And uh, despite your best efforts, there will be periods where you are certainly more productive and successful from the academic side of things. Uh, and then this will wax and wane with being more productive uh, in developing your clinical skills. This is probably more evident in surgery or anaesthetics or other um, specialties where the skills are very tangible and, and obvious. But what I would say is just re recognition of this fact is probably the first way in dealing with it and knowing that you will spend times uh, not progressing in either of those aspects of your career, um, but eventually it'll balance out. Um, and then aside from those, there are some minor points. Uh, in terms of time, clearly trying to pursue two careers takes up more of your time on a day-to-day -day basis, which may include weekends, spending time reading papers or spending more time clinically trying to develop your skills. Length of training overall, especially if you start from an AFP and go all the way through the programme, may be prolonged. There is constant pressure, especially as you get further on from PhD onwards to secure funding. Uh, and in sort of a current financial climate, this is slightly more challenging. Um, there's I mentioned uncertain job prospects, and what I mean by that is that towards the end of your career, there is likely to be more pure clinical consultant contracts, for example, on offer than there are combined contracts. Um, and that is another pressure uh, which, which will happen towards the end of the career. Um, another thing I mention is that if you wish to pursue certainly a basic science or, or lab-based research career, you will be tied to institutions. Um, however, the same could be said for any uh, clinical career which uh, requi requires a tertiary centre. I think hopefully I haven't been too gloomy there, so maybe you want to finish by asking me about the positives. <laughs> well, I'm hoping that the positives will be glowing. Yes. So, what, so what do you think they are? Well, um, I think for a start, it's having pursuing two careers, uh, especially when they're two careers which independently are very attractive. Uh, lots of people have great fun um, being a doctor or surgeon, and equally, a lot of the scientists I work with in the lab are very enthusiastic. So you can imagine combining them both makes, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, clinical academics feel like they have the best job in the world. And certainly going home and speaking with uh, my medical colleagues who stick to a clinical career, I certainly feel like I've got um, an advantage over them in that every day I get home and I've done something uh, slightly different, which in my opinion, and I hope my colleagues would agree, much more exciting. Um, throughout your career, if you combine a, an academic career, you will constantly be at the forefront of uh, medical technology, interventions, uh, developments, which 
will benefit your clinical career, knowing some of the improvements in treatments, for example, on a day-to-day -day basis, I think will uh, have benefit for your patients. Um, now, on the flip side of being tied to an institution, sometimes being tied to a tertiary centre, for example, does have it, its benefits in access to novel treatments or certainly uh, research techniques. Um, the other benefit is and whether you like going on planes or not, a prerequisite is networking and going to conferences and meeting other clinical academics across the world can be very invigorating and, and help your own research along. Um, so hopefully those outweigh the previous negative aspects I mentioned. I don't know if you have any further to add. I think one of the things that I've noticed over the years um, with a lot of academic trainees who sometimes research doesn't always go the way that you want it and so going back to clinical work seems like an attractive option at times but I've noticed that some clinicians who've done that have then after a year or so come up to me in the corridor and said you know I've decided to continue with my research because actually I really miss it so I think that it does get under your skin and once you've started asking questions and trying to answer them and potentially to look at treatments and things that are going to benefit your patients then you can't you get a bit hooked on that and it's very difficult to give up completely agree um so we have one final question before we leave you i guess the big question is really overall overarching question is how do you combine a career in surgery with academia well, I think uh, out of all the specialties, um, despite being biased as I'm a surgical tra trainee myself, this is one of the biggest questions um, as developing uh, your skills as a surgeon clearly requires uh, a significant amount of time and effort. And uh, in the current training climate where our hours have reduced, this is certainly more of a pressure. Um, but what I would say is that uh, with clinical integrated training programs whereby your training has become more structured and your research time more focused and more productive, um, it's much, much easier uh, and you have the support framework which didn't exist 10, 20 years ago to be able to be successful if you have the enthusiasm and the dedication. In addition, I think historically uh, there was a tendency for people to focus on basic science or lab-based projects which were in some way related to surgery. And that led to some people doing projects they may not have enjoyed and not continuing afterwards. Whereas today, the scope for uh, academic uh, component to a surgical career has increased significantly. And this includes management leadership programs, but uh, even more so modern technology, especially within uh, surgical techniques. And people can pursue whole clinical academic careers along these fields. And so if you find there's something that you're interested in, which doesn't necessarily involve a pipette in cell culture, this shouldn't deter you from pursuing a surgical academic career. Um, and certainly, uh, again, for the benefit of patients, especially with these new novel therapies, uh, being a surgical academic means that you're able to bring to the table uh, possibly more um, for your patients and benefit them uh, as a whole. And so don't be put off. And I think it's certainly feasible. And uh, watch this space. Maybe I'll come back in five and ten years and tell you that it's uh, possible to go all the way. Thank you very much for uh, your time today. You're welcome. Before we go, if you want any further information about some of the topics we've talked about today, I can direct you to some useful websites. Uh, for the NIHR side of things, it's www.nihr.ac.uk. UCAGS, which is the Oxford Clinical Academic Graduate School, which has some useful general information, even if you don't apply to Oxford, it's at www.oucags.ox.ac.uk. And finally, for Foundation Programme Academic Applications, it's www.foundationprogramme.nhs.uk. Thank you for listening to another podcast by School of Surgery. Don't forget you can follow us at Facebook by searching School of Surgery, on iTunes or at podomatic.schoolofsurgery.com.